My name is Adam Ward. This is another ISS strategic snapshot. Exactly one month from today, on the 19th of September, the ISS is going to be convening in Oslo, Norway, its annual global strategic review. And one of the principal themes of that meeting will be the dispute between Russia and Ukraine and its wider international uh, ramifications. And in order to discuss this, I'm joined from our Washington, D.C. offices by Dr. Samuel Charup, who is our senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia. Sam, I think we had the news not so very long ago that there's going to be a meeting in Minsk next week, early next week, between the presidents of Ukraine and Russia and the EU's high representative, Catherine Ashton. Um, knowing what you do know about the motives and the interests of all of the parties concerned, um, how do you think the various participants are going to be approaching those discussions? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it's certainly good that there's going to be such a meeting. Um, what's been somewhat disturbing about the last several months of this crisis is that it has escalated is the lack of high-level negotiations and, uh, and even engagement um, among the, the leaders of the states and uh, supranational entities involved. Um, so the fact that the meeting is taking place is certainly a good thing. The, the most that uh, has happened between um, the Russian president and Ukrainian president since um, well, his election in late May, uh, President Poroshenko, is um, a sort of 10-minute uh, chat at, at the Normandy commemoration back in early June. Um, but I think uh, we should uh, have... Uh, sober expectations about what a, an, a meeting like that can produce. We have, at least early in the crisis, seen a number of similar meetings and there was in fact, uh, in the run-up to this announcement of the heads of state meeting, a foreign ministers meeting um, in Berlin just uh, Sunday, two days ago. Um, but at the moment, uh, and what, and what the, which is what makes this crisis so disturbing, is that the uh, interests of the parties seems so um, uh, incompatible and that the sort of Venn diagram of a possible compromise is um, quite hard to imagine at this point. So uh, a de-escalation I think would certainly be in all sides interest, maybe, although one could argue that some actually benefit from upping the ante at the moment. Um, and therefore I, I, you know, although I think it's a good thing that they're meeting, I, I wouldn't expect a, a new um, a world order to emerge from Minsk next week. So no immediate progress, but if you had to imagine the possible shape and outline of an end game, um, what would the various factors and ingredients of that look like to your mind? The key factor right now is whether, um, is, is basically the situation on the ground. Um, for Russia, the insurgency in eastern Ukraine is a means to an end of achieving uh, influence over Ukraine's future and its particularly its foreign policy course. Um, the Ukrainian military and uh, paramilitary forces and the in interior ministry forces have been making significant gains uh, over the last weeks and months and uh, they vastly outman and outgun um, the insurgency as it uh, currently stands. Um, so uh, what Russia does in response to the tactical defeat, on, or soon to be perhaps, on the ground, and also how that situation on the ground evolves, I think, is, is, is the key factor that will uh, sort of de uh, determine the realm of the possible as far as a political compromise is concerned. It's my view that uh, it's highly unlikely that Russia will um, cease its support for the insurgency without a broader political solution that uh, resolution that, that addresses uh, its interests and the reason why it has been pursuing this um, this war. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, though, I think the, there's a lot of pressure in Ukraine and a lot of momentum to try to win militarily. Um, in fact, negotiation with Russia is very politically difficult in Ukraine right now. Um, and that, I think, creates constraints on how far President Poroshenko can go in terms of uh, limiting his own forces. And there's also a question of the extent to which he can fully limit his own forces on the ground. Um, Russia is seeking out of all of this uh, some reassurances about uh, you know, Ukraine's future, and that will involve um, something to do with uh, the question of NATO, 
clearly there's an issue regarding the uh, EU-Ukraine trade agree agreement, and there's a trilateral negotiation that has been ongoing since July about that. And finally, Russia is seeking um, a degree of decentralization that would allow it uh, to institutionalize its influence within Ukraine by empowering uh, Russophile regions um, to uh, make their own decisions about uh, policy. Um, that's what Russia wants. Uh, you know, how much of that Ukraine can and the West can abide is, is an open question. Yes, I suppose the, what you're describing is a situation in which a number of conditions are met, but the end result would not necessarily be a Ukraine that is economically or politically viable in some ways. There are some questions about the viability of Ukraine regardless of what happens. Um, purely as a result of the war, we're talking about uh, a significant um, civil conflict in a country um, that is very dependent on the areas where most of the conflict is taking place for its economic livelihood and uh, for employment of its people. Um, I mean, if there, it, it particularly affects some sectors more than others, like the military industrial sector, which is still supplying um, Russian customers, which are in many cases the only customers of a lot of its large um, enterprises, uh, even though Ukraine and Russia are essentially at war. Um, but more broadly, you know, Russia is the destination for about a third of Ukraine's exports. So um, if the, a Ukraine that is completely cut off from its uh, neighbor, its huge neighbor, uh, seems to me, uh, raises some serious questions about viability over the long term. Um, but then there's the political questions surrounding how the post-war Ukrainian polity is going to be able to come together uh, and have a sense of common purpose. Um, it's always been a country that has had significant political divisions. Many of them will clearly have been deepened by uh, the loss of life and um, the civil conflict that has, you know, that is a part of the broader crisis. Um, there's also the question directly about what happens to all these uh, uh, mostly men who have been under arms for the last six months and um, whether uh, they will prove a destabilizing force in Ukrainian politics. Just in the last few days, one of the major paramilitary groups has threatened a march on Kiev if uh, you know, the Minister of Interior doesn't change his ways. So um, I think you know, there's, uh, th there might be a bit of a boomerang effect. Now, even if the situation can be stabilized and a kind of a political understanding can be reached. What you're describing is a situation in which there continues to be some contestation between the West and Russia over Ukraine. How do you see that really infecting uh, the wider strategic relationship where we know cooperation between Russia and the West on many levels, such as non-proliferation, but not only that, uh, continue to be vital? How do we contain the situation with Ukraine uh, and not jeopardize um, all of those important features of the West and Russian relationship? Well, I think that's the key question. At the, at, at the end of the day, um, even though the immediate cause of Russian actions, both in terms of the annexation of Crimea and the destabilization of eastern Ukraine, related to the way in which power changed hands in Ukraine itself in late February, the broader context in which it occurred is precisely this tug of war between Russia and the West over, quote unquote, its, uh, its neighbors, Russia's neighbors, the former Soviet republics, and Ukraine uh, was always the biggest you know, prize in that tug of war. Um, the problem is that it's, it seems to me highly unlikely that um, in the short term, a, uh, something that, a, a solution that addresses the, that fundamental root of the conflict can be found. So we're going to be living with a degree of that contestation going forward that has now sort of exited the realm of everyday, um, uh, uh, you know, competition and really entered a very uh, serious and uh, conflictual phase. And I think the uh, spillover effects that you're hinting at are inevitable and already being felt. Um, Russia is, uh, by dint of Purely its you know, nuclear status, its uh, position as a member of the 
uh, permanent, uh, a permanent member of the Security Council as of the Quartet in the Middle East, of any other number of uh, international bodies from the five-party talks in, in over North Korea's nuclear program to the P5 plus one in the context of Iran, um, is, you know, at the table and a key player on any number of broader international issues. Um, but I think increasingly we the reservoir of goodwill, which was pretty minimal uh, even before this crisis started on both sides, to work together to solve these common challenges is running dry at this point. And we shouldn't underestimate in this context Russia's capacity to play the spoiler. Um, when it wants to, it can really complicate uh, particularly Western foreign policy objectives in both this region and uh, it, meaning its neighborhood and other parts of the world, it's uh, you know one particular example that comes to mind is the um, <clears throat> contracted but then eventually canceled sale of the S three hundred air defense system to Iran um, in uh, well before the UN Security Council sanctions were imposed that Russia agreed to, which would have you know been a highly destabilizing um, uh, arms sale if it had been uh, seen through. Good. Sam, thank you very much indeed.